Good day, everyone. I warmly thank the organizer for having invited me to this Liverpool course, and my special thanks go to Professor David Beck and Seiko. My title is about the clinical pharmacology of dual regimens, and especially focused on the first two recently approved regimens based on two drugs only. Here are my potential conflict of interest. And this is more or less the crude history of antiretroviral therapy with years of monotherapy. A short window of dual NRTI therapy, and then the progressive availability of new drug classes together, very important, with a real pharmacodynamic parameter to be tested, here represented by the measurement of HIV RNA. By trying to plot on an Emax model graph the different regimens we have been using over time, considering the various factors contributing to describe the properties of an antiretroviral regimen, such as intrinsic potency, genetic barrier, forgiveness, tolerability, toxicity. This is my personal hierarchy of the options currently available as based on my personal perception of the relative strength of the different regimens. We see here unboosted PIs, NNRTIs, boosted PIs, first generation integrase inhibitors and second generation integrase inhibitors. And this is the European translation as guidelines of what is today recommended as first or second choice for starting antiretroviral therapy. We see first and second line options consisting of three drugs, but for the first time, newly developed dual regimens are also officially included with few restrictions. Two drug regimens are also recognized as options for switching, as it is the case of dolutegravir 3TC itself, according to the Tango study, and dolutegravir relpivirine, according to the Swartz studies. Two boosted PI solutions are also listed, although based on a series of smaller studies. As I mentioned before, two drug regimens have been also tested in the past. As we can see here, the CSER trial that promoted the use of 3TC with a small but recognizable effect of the 3TC containing arm. And on the right, the study comparing for the first time two triple regimens with a dual option consisting of efavirenz and indinavir. The latter was less successful than the comparators, but testifies how the idea of possibly using two instead of two drugs was already there. Afterwards, particularly with the increasing use of boosted PIs, a number of small or medium-sized trials were carried out, often with appreciable results, but in no cases a registration study was performed. However, this phase allowed us to understand that dual regimens tend to perform better when a reverse transcriptase inhibitor is also included. And a relatively strong demonstration of the importance of uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, came from the results of the trial comparing a conventional regimen consisting of boosted uh, daronavir with FTC and tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate with a dual arm made by raltegavir and darunavir, uh, boosted daronavir. At that time, the, the common belief was that these two drugs, I mean raltegavir and darunavir, were the most potent ones available. So it was to some extent surprising to see how such dual regimen was suboptimally active in case of high viral loads and lower CD40 cell count at baseline. And the reason might be the long time taken by reverse transcriptors in each viral replication cycle, accounting for more than 50%. That is probably testifies that we need a reverse transcriptase inhibitors in any antiretroviral regimen. Things changed a few years ago when two dual regimens were studied in naive and experienced patients in carefully planned registration trial. First was the first where the SWORD studies uh, in which patients uh, in the study arm were switched to the dual regimen consisting of dolutegravir and relpivirin and gave evidence of full non-inferiority as compared to the control arm in which patients continued on their conventional triple regimen. Even more exciting were the results of the Gemini studies in naive patients with up to 500,000 viral copies at baseline. Patients who started with dolutegravir and 3TC had a, a non-inferior performance as compared to those taking dolutegravir, FTC, and TDF, with only minor inconsistencies recorded in patients with less than 200 CD40 cell counts at baseline. Bearing in mind the role of 
reverse transcriptase inhibitors, inhibitors in dual regimens, as previously mentioned, we, we must consider the properties of integrase inhibitors, especially in terms of potency. In this, in, in this slide, the log expressed viral load decrease in the typical 10-day monotherapy study is shown, and we can appreciate how the quicker how quicker are the integrase inhibitors in reducing the viral load as compared to older drug classes? Here is the very popular 10-day monotherapy study with dolotegravir, and it is shown, uh, we, we, we can see how eight patients achieved less than 50 copies in less than 10 days with just one drug, and one patient did so uh, just taking two milligram of dolotegravir daily. So in clinical pharmacological terms, the more rapid action of integrase is seen here when uh, it, uh, an integrase inhibitor, dolutegravir namely, is compared to a favorance. This translates into a much shorter exposure of replicating variants, which implies a reduced possibility to select out resistant quasi-species with a clear advantage in terms of genetic barrier. Uh, the strengths of integrase inhibitors, you know, see here there is a popular statement made for bacterial infection that dead bugs do not mutate. But to some extent, extent this can be applied to uh, viral infection as well. The strength of integrase inhibitors, especially in case of high baseline viral copies, is also shown here in this comparative meta analysis. But according to what we pretend today in terms of suppression, suppressive capacity of an antiretroviral regimen, we tend to look at the virological performance as evaluated by ultra-sensitive assay. You see here less than 50, less than 20, less than two, less than one copy, such as target non-detected. And we, um, and although less standardized, we started to also to look at the, the size of the viral reservoirs in terms of proviral DNA. By looking at a so-called target not detected that should correspond to less than a single copy per um, milliliter, there are no doubts that the performance in both the lutegravir real fever in the small studies and the lutegravir 3TC in the Gemini naive studies are not different uh, when compared to the triple regimen here used as a comparator. And the same seems to also apply to the size of the viral reservoir, as seen in this Italian study, there seems to be no difference between dual and triple regimens in terms of viral DNA. So uh, what does the doctor think when she, he has to decide whether prescribing a dual or a triple regimen? Here are two limiting immuno immunovirological parameters as set by the Gemini study with the choice for the triple regimens to be made in case of viral copies exceeding 500,000 per milliliter at baseline, and preferentially when the patient has less than 200 CD40 cell count at baseline. But the main driver is probably to establish to what extent the patient will be adherent to, to therapy. Here, we have an in vitro simulation that was made for a patient who is going to miss some doses to regimens where compared, namely the triple big category FTC and TAF and dolutegravir 3 tc as, as we can see, expectedly, the viral regrowth become apparent sooner in case of a dual therapy when the, the drug is taken off from the supernatal, with some consequences also in terms of drug resistance selection. We must consider, however, that several limitations of this experimental framework, as he has stated, including in vivo dynamic factors and pharmacological factors as well. The fact that some failure does occur also in the control samples testif testifies that such experiment does not reproduce the reality in vivo. Failure of the lutegravir 3 tc is uh, very unlikely in case of full adherence. However, there are insights from other dual regimens, as the one here shown, carbotegravir and rilpivirin, that if the drug exposure is not the one expected, uh, here is the case of rilpivirin in, in few patients of the latter study, virological failure may actually occur, although uh, at a very low rate, but uh, you know, in, in, in the lower quartile, uh, half of the patients who had uh, a lower exposure uh, that of rilpivirin did actually, uh, actually fail. 
a review of uh, the patients, the few patients who failed with capothecary of rilpivirin demonstrated that three are the main factors possibly accounting for virological failure, such as the presence of a viral A6 subtype, a high body mass index, and a pre-existing mutation for rilpivirin. But even looking at other uh, settings, here is a phase two trial combining the new uh, reverse transcriptase translocase inhibitor, such as islatavir, with doravirin, there seems to be a suboptimal viral inhibition in few patients, with viral load, viral load fluctuating in between 50 and 200 viral copies, possibly due to, but yet to be proven, to the particular mechanism of action of islatavir, which has an oxidral in position tray, tree, so it works as delayed chain terminator. It is possible that some viral RNA is measured in spite of belonging to variants that are no longer viable and infectious, but has been, has not yet proven. And a further point concerned the poor penetration of antiretroviral in some sanctuaries, like lymph nodes, where the viral load decrease might be less spectacular as compared to the one seen in plasma. But looking at other compartments, no difference are seen. This is an example in the effects of a dual versus a triple regimen in the new neurological compartment. And this is a very hot point for antiretrovirals. So the issue of tissue penetration with a possible suboptimal inhibition of viral replication might impact on another parameter, possibly a new pharmacodynamic parameter for antiretrovirals, such as the one concerning the degree of immune activation or hyperinflammation. However, while it has been proven that monotherapy is actually inferior to triple therapy in decreasing several markers of immune activation, the same does not seem to apply for dual regimens, although the issue has been poorly studied so far. So at, at the end of the story, which is again my perception, which is the, concerning the position of the lutegravir based dual regimen in the hierarchy of the treatments we have to, today, I guess this will be the possible current position where I put the lutegravir based dual therapy with possible future refinements according to uh, the, the future clinical research. And the final decision is for the doctor with many different factors to be considered when choosing between a dual and a triple regimen. So the doubts uh, concern many points, you know, especially uh, the duration of treatment, the number or duration of treatment so far uh, made by the patient, number of regimens changed, number of failures, resistance selection, associated disorders, nadir CD40 cell count, Zenit HIV RNA, frequency of PCR signals, uh, I mean, the, what we call bleep and comorbidities. But at the end, also some insight from the experienced doctor concerning the evaluation of life habits and the estimation of individual adherence. I thank you very much for your attention.